Good morning everyone and welcome back to another Civi 398 to Continuum Mechanics lecture. Uh, as always I'm your instructor Clayton. Uh, unfortunately today I will not be having a webcam so you'll not be able to see me. As I mentioned to the in-person class uh, I'm currently moving right now so everything is kind of lost in the shuffle. I wasn't even really planning to be recording this lecture but uh, as you guys may have noticed <laughs> by my numerous emails there was some problems with the uh, audio software, not the audio software, the capture software for the in-person lecture today. So because of that, I'm recording this lecture again at home so that you guys can have kind of the best possible quality. I looked at the quality that was captured. It wasn't that great. The problem uh, from the AV techs uh, was apparently my iPad. Uh, the software they're using wasn't really compatible. So what would happen is, is the cameras of me in person worked fine, the audio, that also worked fine. But when it came to capturing my iPad screen for both the uh, PowerPoint presentation as well as just the general notes and examples, it would, it would sometimes freeze, sometimes it would black out, so there would be a lot of content missing. Now you guys don't deserve that, you guys deserve the best, which is why I am here uh, re-recording the entire lecture, <laughs> which is... Uh, uh, it kind of sucks, let's be honest. It sucks for me, but it also sucks for you guys because I know that uh, the best experience you guys can have would be the exact replica of that in-person lecture. So I'm going to try my best to repeat it exactly how I did it in person. There might be tiny, tiny modifications, but I promise you that all the key information will be there. All right, so again, I apologize for the uh, university's issues with this uh, capture software, but... Uh, moving forward, next lecture, lecture three, I have my own plan. I'm going to record it myself so that I don't have to really rely on that university software. And from there, I should be able to get you guys the videos out even faster, which which will be great. All right, so that's kind of uh, the first part of this introduction. The second part is seminars. So as I told the in-person students, seminars begin this week. Uh, we had one yesterday, which was nice. It was fun. Uh, <laughs> the capture software didn't work yesterday either, so I had to write it on the whiteboard. And we have a seminar tomorrow for those in-person in students in Section E2. And as I sent an email out for the online students, we're going to have a seminar on Thursdays from 5 to 6 at night. Hopefully everyone can make it. There is a Zoom link in the assignment section on eClass, so you guys can kind of jump in. And again, the seminars are just for us to go over the assignments. Uh, talk about the tips, the tricks, all the fun stuff. It's it's not a, it's not a timed exam or anything like that. It should be nice and relaxed. So that's with seminars. Now that kind of covers all the uh, preliminary introductions to this course. We can more or less jump into the lecture now. So today we're going to be covering two things: types of maps and linear vector spaces. In the previous lecture, we focused on mathematical preliminaries. Basically, we were talking about the nomenclature of a lot of these different uh, linear algebra math symbols. And that was just kind of an introduction to uh, some things that you'll see during this course. You're gonna see a lot of it in today's lecture and you'll see a lot of it in the online textbook, but it's not something we really test you guys on. Again, it's just background of what's to come. Today is kind of more or less the first lecture when it comes to this uh, idea of continuum mechanics. So we're gonna talk about types of maps and then we're going to transition into linear vector spaces. Now I'm going to pull up my notepad right now, so hopefully you guys can see it on my iPad. And we're going to try and talk about what do I mean when I talk about a linear map. So again, Civi 398, this idea of continuum mechanics, is more a structural engineering related course. What I like to call it is simulation math. If I know the boundary conditions and the initial state of my structure, can I simulate loads on it, such as earthquakes, wind, etc.? So let's say that I have a frame. So I'm just going to draw a frame just like this. I'm going to draw it a lot bigger than I made it uh, in the in-person lecture. I, ma I made it kind of small and it may have been hard to see. So let's say that I have a single one-story frame like this. It's fixed at both ends. And from this frame, I'm going to place a load on it. So I'm going to take my green over here and I'm going to place a load on my frame as such. And we're going to call this F. All right, so this is a load. Now what happens to this frame is we know that 
naturally, when I place the load on it, it's going to start getting deflected laterally. So what's going to happen is the frame might end up something like this. Now, will it end up exactly like this? Who knows? It has to do a lot with the properties of the frame. Let's just say for intensive purposes right now, it ends up like this. So I'm just going to draw it across. So let's say our frame ends up something like this. We experience some lateral deflection and we also experience a little bit of vertical deflection. Now, if I were to talk to you guys about linear maps, this is how I would put it. This is actually what we say is two different configurations. The first configuration is the pink configuration. This is basically before we apply any loads to our frame. We call this the undeformed configuration. If we look at the blue part, we would call this the deformed configuration, because as we can see, the frame has now deflected due to those loads. And the idea of a linear map is to track points between these two configurations. So what I would do is I could say, okay, at the top right corner over here, which I circled in red, I have a coordinate point, which we can call X naught and Y naught. This makes sense to us. And what we can do is we can track this point into the deformed configuration. So if we look down at the blue frame, we can see now that this point has moved. It's now what we would say is something like x1, y1, something like that. Now you're saying, Clayton, you're just moving points around. You're not really doing anything special. And yes, that's true. But if we look at the idea of these coordinate points here, they can be written as a vector. Basically, and I'll switch colors, I have a two component vector. I apply some sort of deformation, which is going to be my linear map. And I get a vector with the same number of components, but now the entries have changed. So I hope you guys see where I'm going with this. What we can do is we can take a vector, apply a linear map, and then we get a new vector. In this specific case, what I'm saying is, is we can take our original coordinate points, apply our matrix, which is going to account for both the properties of the frame as well as the loads, and then we get a new deflection, right? We get a new coordinate point. Now, is that what we really do when it comes to structural engineering? Well, probably not. The equation that we are most familiar with, and I'm going to come and write it down right here, is this equation right here. So I'm going to put in brackets. We have a matrix, which we call K, and this K right here is what we call our stiffness matrix. This has all the properties of our frame. So this would include geometric properties such as the height, as well as material properties such as the Young's modulus, etc. And what we do is we take this stiffness matrix and we multiply it by a vector u, which is the deflection of the frame. So this deflection x1, y1, this would actually be included in that u vector. Now what happens is, is this is actually equal to my force vector. So we're gonna have a second vector on the other side, which is my forces. So this is where that green force would be included. Now, if we look at here, K here, this stiffness matrix, that would be our linear map because it takes our displacement vector and converts it into a force vector. This is the most common application in structural engineering. Now, if we look at actual design, we actually have a little bit of a problem. Typically, and I'm saying typically, I know it's not always the case, but typically we don't know the displacements of our structure. Typically we know the loads that we place on our structure. So if I know what F is, the loads on my structure, and I know what the linear map K is, and we're not going to discuss how to determine K in this course, that's the topic for later courses, what we can do is we can actually determine what our displacements in our structure are. How do we do this? Well, we have to invert K to the other side. So what we do is we'd get rid of it on this side and we'd have to write it on the other side as K inverse. All right, so that's what we have to do. Now this is actually pretty important in later subjects because everyone says, well, Clayton, why does computation take so long? I'm confused. Everyone complains that every model takes forever to run. Well, in a nutshell, this is re the reason why, is we have to take this matrix K and invert it. Now, mathematically, that's going to take a lot of time. 
and as k increases in size, it's going to take even longer. So again, the idea I wanna show you guys here is that k is a linear map. It takes one vector and it transforms it into another vector. And the applications are endless. In this application, we can take a displacement vector and convert it to a force vector. But one of the main ones we are going to look at in this course is going to be taking a stress vector and converting it to a strain vector or vice versa. If I have a strain vector, can I figure out what my stress vector is? So that's kind of a little introduction into what we're going to be focusing on. So let's jump into the PowerPoint and begin with types of maps. This is going to be the first uh, kind of subject we're going to cover. So linear maps. Now, if you guys look at E class, linear maps is actually a topic of lectures four, five, and six. So I'm going to briefly introduce it to you guys now, but we're going to kind of come back in more detail. So by definition, a linear map T between two vector spaces V and W. So this would kind of be like from the undeformed to the deformed configuration. So that is any function such that for any vectors U and V, which are members of the undeformed vector space, and any scalars alpha and beta possess this property. So basically if I were to go alpha, which is a scalar multiplied by a vector u, plus beta times a vector v, and input that into my linear map, well that's going to be the same as going alpha multiplied by the linear map when I input the vector u, plus beta multiplied by the linear map when I input vector v. Now again, this doesn't make a lot of sense right now, and it shouldn't. This is just the basic definition I wanted to give you guys but we're gonna be covering it a lot more later on. Now, examples of linear maps are actually quite simple. So example one, our function is gonna go from the set of real numbers to the set of real numbers, so one dimension. So an example of a linear map for this would be a function where we have a scalar alpha multiplied by x. Now right away, it doesn't look like it's a linear map, but let's kind of do an example. Let's say that our linear map was 7x. Well, we can do this right here, where I can take that linear map 7x, I can input 2, and then I get 14. So when you guys think of linear maps, I want you guys to think of it like this. This 2 right here, this is the input. This could be, for instance, our original deflection. We input it into our linear map. In this case, it's 7x, so then we go 7 times 2, and then we get an output. So in this case, 14. So for instance, we could say we input two millimeters of deflection and we ended up with 14 millimeters of deflection, something like that. So that's how I want you guys to think of these linear maps. We have an input, we throw it into our map, and then we receive an output. So this was very basic, this was one dimension, but we can carry this to over to two dimensions. Now two dimensions, a linear map is actually going to be, like I said, a matrix. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this matrix, in this case it'd be alpha 1 1, alpha 1 2, alpha 2 1, and alpha 2 2, and we multiply it by a vector. So again, if we want an example, we can substitute values for all those alpha components, and we can write it as follows, where I can input a vector, in this case, 1 2, and then at the end I get another output, which is going to be 9 comma 0. So even though it looks different than example 1, it follows the same routine where we have an input, we put it into our linear map, and then we receive an output. So that's what we're going to be focused on a lot in this course. Now, I have to put a little bit of a disclaimer. The idea of these linear maps, we don't call them matrices. They're actually referred to as tensors. What's nice for us is in this class, we're sticking to two-dimensional and three-dimensional vector space. Now, in that case, our linear maps are going to be second order tensors. And we're going to talk about tensors later on. What's nice for us though, is that a second order tensor is basically equivalent to a matrix. So I want to uh, have this disclaimer to kind of say, if you guys ever hear me say tensor, you guys can think of it as matrix or vice versa. There's only going to be a select number of cases in this course where me calling something a tensor would not be a matrix. And I'm going to make sure I outline them uh, very, very clearly. So you don't have to worry about that. Again, I just wanna let you guys know if I say tensor, I'm referring to the matrix or vice versa. If I say matrix, I'm actually referring to that second order tensor. All right, so linear maps, we're gonna discuss a lot later, 
But the focus of this particular lecture is the different types of linear maps. So maps or functions between sets can be basically three different things. The first one is going to be injective, which basically means each input I throw in is going to have a unique output. And we're going to talk about what exactly that means in a little bit. The second one is surjective, where every output has an input. Again, this is the one which confuses students the most. But again, we're going to talk about it, and I'm sure you guys will be fine. After that, we have bijective, or it's also called invertible. And this property is when a map is both injective as well as surjective. Now, if it's not injective and it's not surjective, then we can say that it's actually just none of the above. But the focus of this course is going to be this third one here, bijective. And the reason why is that idea that it is invertible. That's going to be the key here. We want our linear maps to be invertible. If we looked back at that equation that we covered in the notes where we had k times u is equal to f, well, if we're not able to invert k, we can't solve for anything. So again, it's going to be very important to us that our linear maps are indeed invertible. Now, you guys may be saying, eh, this kind of looks like crap, Clayton, I'm not liking what I'm seeing. Uh, how can I visually see what these maps mean? Well, let's do an example. So let's go back to the idea where we had a function which was just some scalar alpha multiplied by x. Now this function right here would be injective because for every value of x, there is only one unique output. So if I input x equals two, I'm only going to have one unique output of y. Now it's kind of hard to see in this one. In the next example, it'll make a lot more sense. But basically, the trick here for these injective functions is to just draw a horizontal line. If this horizontal line intersects our function more than once, it is not injective because there is one, uh, there's two inputs of x that are associated with the same value of y. That's the key here. Every input of x must have one value of y. That's it. If we were to look at this one too, we can also say that this function is surjective. Now when it comes to surjective, we want to look at the output range. In this case, we look at the y-axis, and we can say that every value on this y-axis can be achieved using this function. If I wanted y equals 100, well then all I have to do is input a specific value of x. If I wanted y equals negative uh, 3000, I can input a value of x and get that value. So that's what surjective has to deal with. Now, since this function is both surjective and injective, we would actually say that this function is bijective or invertible. So it's kind of hard to see. The best way to really show you guys is to give you guys an example where it's neither. So let's look at this function right here, which is the absolute value of x. If we were to look at if this function is injective, we can say that it is actually not injective. Again, the best way to do this is to draw a horizontal line. If I were to draw a horizontal line here, it intersects my function twice. What does this mean? Well, this means that there are two different values of x associated with the exact same value of y. This is why it is not injective. When it comes to the idea of it being surjective, it would not be surjective. Because again, when we look at surjective, we look at the y-axis. Can this function give us every value on that y-axis? And if we look here, there is no possible way for us to get a negative output using this particular function. And because of that, we would say that it is not surjective. So that's the idea of types of linear maps. Now to really help you guys understand what we're talking about, let's go into a little example. All right, so here are the examples. Now, this is typically what it would look like in a midterm or an exam type scenario for my class, or what I would say is we have a function which is defined on a domain and it goes to a specific codomain, and then we give you the actual function details. Now, what tends to throw students off are, is the idea of the domain, which is this first letter, and then the specified codomain, which is this letter. So we're going to talk about those and what exactly they mean. So I'm going to erase all the pink here. 
and we're going to talk about the first property. So again, when we deal with these types of linear maps, we're basically saying, is it injective and is it surjective? And from those two ideas, we can actually conclude that if it's bijective or if it's actually none of the above. So if we look at this function here, we have to ask ourselves, is it injective? Now to determine if something is injective, we just draw a straight line. So if I were to draw a straight line through this function, we can see that it only ever intersects the function once. This means that this would be an injective map. So I'm gonna to come to the side here and I'm just going to write injective because we know that it is going to be injective. And the reason why is because for every value of X that I input, there is only going to be one associated value of Y. If I were to input X is equal to 30 right here, I'm going to get a value of Y is equal to 30. There's no other way I can get 30 uh, besides X is equal to 30. So it is injective. Now the second one is, is it surjective? So I'm gonna to go to blue for surjective. And for surjective, there's actually a trick and that's where these two numbers come in. When we deal with surjective functions or determining if it is surjective, we always want to look at the specified codomain, which is going to be that second letter there. This letter there tells us all the output values we need in order for this function to be indeed surjective. So if we look right here, the, the letter is the set of real numbers, the complete set of real numbers. That means for this set to be surjective or this function to be surjective, I need to have every value accounted for on this y axis. Now, if we look at this function, it does account for every single value. If I wanted y is equal to a million, well, I have a value of x that will give me that value. If I wanted y is equal to negative 50, I have a value of x that gives me that value. So since every value in the set of real numbers is accounted for using this function, we can also say that this one would indeed be surjective. So I'm gonna go surjective. Now, since the function is both injective as well as surjective, we would actually say that this function is bijective, which is great for us because if it's bijective, it means it's invertible, which is what we want. So I'm gonna go down, uh, I'm not sure which color to use. Uh, orange, I guess, try and make it a different color. So again, since it is both injective and surjective, we would say that this linear map is actually bijective. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's do a couple more examples to really show you guys the different meanings. So in this case, we have the function x squared. Now I have three different scenarios I can look at. Again, we have the domain and then we have the specified codomain. And that's the same in every case. Now, if we look here, the domain is what we plot our function over. So if we say, all right, our domain is the set of real numbers, well then I'm plotting my function from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. So we would have something like the picture on the left. Now, if we look at this function, oops, gonna go to the eraser. The first question is, is, is it injective? So again, the best way to determine, do the horizontal line test. And if I were to do a horizontal line test right here, we can see that we have, or we intersect our function twice. This means that it is not going to be injective because there is two possible x values right here and right here. So I'm gonna say x1 and x2 that return us the exact same value of y. That's why it is not injective. Two values of x that are different return the same y value. So what I would go is I go over here and I would say not injective. So it's gonna be the same process as we see for every single one. So this is not injective. I'm just going to erase these here and we're gonna move on to the second one, which is it surjective? Now for surjective, the, the key is always to look at that specified codomain. In this case, our specified codomain is the set of real numbers. So what I would do is I'd go to my picture and I would highlight the set of real numbers. So I need every value in this blue circle. But as we can see, 
this function can never give me a negative value. So therefore, since some of these outputs are not accounted for in our function, we would say that this one is not surjective. And again, the reason why is because we have this whole set of negative values down here that are not accounted for in our function. So let's erase this now and let's move on to the second one. So I, I actually, for the first one, I would say that if this, uh, actually I'll, I'll, I'll label it. So we went to orange. So since it is not injective and not surjective, I would actually say that this function is none of the above. So I'm running out of room, I'll just put A. I would call this function none of the above. Now, if we look at the second example, we're still plotting over the exact same domain. What changes now is going to be our codomain. So this is going to be the trick for part B here. So if we were to do our test to see if it's injective, well, we're still plotting over the entire set of real numbers. So our function is going to look like the picture. And again, if I were to draw a horizontal line, well, we have the same problem as before where we intersect this function twice. So just like before, nothing's changed this would still not be injective, so not injective. However, something funny happens, let's change colors, when we talk about if this function is surjective. So again, when we deal with surjective, we're always looking at the specified codomain. In this case, our specified codomain is now the positive set of real numbers. So you see that little positive sign? means the positive set of real numbers. So instead of going from negative infinity to infinity, our now specified codomain is zero to infinity, but not including zero. So if we were to look at this, what I would do is I'd look at the specified codomain and I would highlight it in the picture. So again, my specified codomain is now this set of numbers here. So if I were to look at this set of numbers, I can see that my function actually accounts for every set in, the, in this specified codomain. So in this particular case, this function would be surjective because all of those outputs are accounted for. So this would be surjective. And if I were to say if this is not injective, but it is surjective, well then I would just call this surjective. Now the last one is where it gets a little bit tricky, uh, but it's, it's not too bad. And that is this we now changed our domain. Not our specified codomain, but our actual domain. So this is important because this first letter here, we haven't really talked about it, but this is where we plot our function over. So if we look at our function on the left that we actually drew a picture of, we plotted it from negative infinity to infinity. But if we were to look at this part here, it says, well, that's not our domain anymore. Our domain is just from zero to positive infinity. It's only the set of real numbers. So in this case, we would plot our function like this. Again, we're starting now, and I'll switch to red. We're starting now just after zero. It does not include zero, but it starts just after zero, and then the function is plotted. Now, how does this change things? Well, if I were to draw my horizontal line to determine if it is injective or not, we now only have that single intersection. Therefore, this function would be injective. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm going to say that this function is injective because now we only have one set of, or one value of y for every value of x. However, if we were to look at if this function is surjective, so I'm gonna switch over to blue, we have to look at the specified codomain. In this particular case, it is the entire set of real numbers. So if I were to look at this, this means that I have to account for this entire set. And just like in part A, we have nothing for the negative region. So therefore, this function would not be surjective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go not surjective. So hopefully that makes sense. If we were to come down here to example number three, it's actually going to be the identical to example number two. So I'm not gonna cover it here, but if you guys want to cover it, 
in quiz number two, which is the types of linear maps in the solution guide that I posted on eClass, it has the complete solution for even example number three. So you guys can look at it if you guys want. So that's going to be it for types of linear maps. It'll probably appear on the first midterm and it'll probably appear maybe one question on the final. But as we can see, it's not too bad once you guys know the tricks. So after the types of linear maps, let's go into the concept of linear vector spaces. Now this is something that a lot of students hate, but it's not too bad once we can start visualizing it. For me, myself, I'm a visual learner. If I can see things, I can understand them better. And that's why as a, as a student in undergrad, I hated linear algebra because a lot of it was infinite dimension spaces or things that I couldn't actually picture. What's nice in this class is we keep it practical. We're concerned about simulating the real world. Well, the real world is three dimensions. And in design, we can also have it in two dimensions. So the most we're ever going to deal with in this particular class is going to be two and three dimensions. We don't have to worry about those fourth and fifth dimensions, anything like that, which is, of course, really great for us. Now we have to talk about the idea of linear vector spaces. When we talked about at the very beginning about that frame that was being deflected, I said that it went from an undeformed to a deformed configuration. Now the key here is with both of those configurations, they were a linear vector space. So we got to talk about what exactly is a linear vector space because it'll help give us some insight into what we can do with these vector spaces. So a linear vector space is a set of vectors V and two operators. We basically have addition as well as multiplication such that the following axioms hold for every U, V and W that are vectors and A or sorry alpha and beta that are just real numbers. The first one is closed under addition. So if I were to take a vector u and add it to vector v, well the resultant u plus v must also be in that vector space. This is going to be one of the key ones. The second one is that if I were to take vector u and add it to vector v, well that should be the exact same as v plus u. That kind of makes sense. We have more that have to do with addition and then we get a special one right here is that the vector space must contain a zero vector. And by definition, this vector, when added to another vector u, must return us with the same vector. So u plus a zero vector is gonna still just be equal to u. And finally, we have a neutral element of addition. So I can take a vector u and add it to its inverse, in this case, it'd just be negative u, and I end up with zero. So as we can see, these first five axioms have to deal with vector addition, with the first one being most critical. Now, if we were to go even further, there's a six axiom that basically says, if I were to have a vector u in this vector space, and I were to multiply it by a scalar alpha, well, alpha times u, that resultant, must also be in our vector space. This is going to be another key one that we're gonna talk about later on. From this, we can form other properties, such as alpha multiplied by u plus v, is going to be the same as alpha u plus alpha v. We can go alpha plus beta, so two scalars added together and then multiplied by u, is the same as going alpha u plus beta u. And then we have just more of those multiplication properties. Now the final one, which we kind of see a little bit later on, is that if we were to take one and multiply by our vector u, well, we should end up with u. So it makes sense to you guys, right? Like these are all very common things. And this is why we talked a lot about the idea of closed under addition, closed under multiplication in the last lecture, because now we're giving it kind of additional complexity. When we talked about it last lecture, we talked about it with just simple numbers. We said, well, two plus three is equal to five. Five is a real number, therefore it's closed under addition, etc. So these last uh, five axioms have to do with multiplication. So let's go through some examples of vector spaces. In two dimensions, we have R2, which can be a vector x, y, where x and y are basically any real number. We can extend this to R3 or three dimensions as a vector x, y, z, where x, y, z are all real numbers. Where it starts becoming not a vector space is once we impose restrictions on those components. Right now, we have no restrictions. We said x, y, and z can be any real number. Once we put restrictions on those numbers, that's when things become a little bit wonky and uh, get out of the range of our linear vector spaces. 
Now, one question you guys might see is the idea of proving vector spaces. And I'm going to tell you this. You never want to try and prove a vector space unless it already tells you that it is a vector space. And the reason why is there is infinite scenarios to consider. The better way to do it is to prove that it is not a vector space. And when we try and disprove these vector spaces, it's best to focus on axioms one and six, closed under addition and closed under that scalar multiplication. Now you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, how exactly would I do this? Well, let's go into an example. Let's say I had the following vector space where we had a vector x, y, but our restrictions now are that x, the component x has to be greater or equal to zero and the component y has to be greater or equal to zero. Well, if I were to plot this in two dimensions, so we have our basis vectors e1 and e2, we basically have to realize that both of these vector components have to be greater or equal to zero. Therefore, my combinations of possible vectors would only occupy this possible space because it has to have a positive E1 and a positive E2 or positive X, positive Y. Now, again, when we try to disprove these vector spaces, we want to focus on axiom one and axiom six. So the first one is closed under addition, which basically means if I take two vectors that are in this vector space and add them together, the resultant should also be in this vector space. So what we're going to say is, all right, I have a purple vector that's in this vector space, and I have a blue vector that is also in this vector space. If I were to add them together, then my resultant vector should also be in this vector space. So if I add them together, which produces the green vector, we can see that yes, it is indeed in that vector space. I'm actually good to go. So therefore this vector space is closed under addition. So, so far so good. Now, the other axiom that's critical is the idea of multiplication by a scalar. If I were to multiply one of these vectors by a scalar, it should always also be in that vector space. So if we were to look at the purple vector and multiply it by two, well, it's just gonna grow by a scale of two, it'll still be in our vector space. The problem starts to happen when we multiply by a negative number. So let's say we take this purple vector and multiply it by negative one. Remember, that changes the direction of a vector. So if I were to take the purple vector, multiply it by negative one, well, then it pops over to the other side. And as we can see, it now exits our vector space. So since we multiply by a negative scalar and exited the vector space, we would say that this idea of V here is actually not a linear vector space. So this is an idea where it was unable to hold axiom six close under multiplication by a scalar. We can also look at other examples. So in this case, our restriction is that the component X multiplied by Y has to be greater or equal to zero. So our product of our vector components greater or equal to zero. So this leaves us with two possible scenarios now for our vector space. We have it where both components are positive and where both components are negative because if both components are negative, negative multiplied by negative, well, gives us a positive. This actually fixes the idea of closed under multiplication by scalar. Because if we were to take our purple vector and now multiply it by a negative scalar, well, it can pop down to the other side, but this other side is now in our vector space. So axiom six now holds. What starts to become a problem though is the idea of that closed under addition. So let's say that in this vector space, we have a second vector, which is now the blue vector. And if I were to add the blue vector to the purple vector and get my green vector, well, we can see that this now exits the vector space. So the addition of two vectors can exit the vector space. This violates axiom one. We would actually say that this is not a vector space. So hopefully the idea of now of vector spaces makes sense to you guys. Uh, I will not usually have these in exams. It's because it's, it's more of a proof. And as you guys know, all of my exams are going to be multiple choice. So these two, uh, the idea of vector spaces not covered in the exams. But one thing I will tell you guys is that it will appear on your first assignment. But the first assignment's a little bit different. I don't ask you to prove if it is or is not a vector space. I say prove that it is. So I already told you guys that it is going to be a vector space. You guys are going to have to prove that it is. How do you guys do that? Well, you're just going to show me that the vector space I provide 
is closed under addition and is closed under scalar multiplication. That's all you guys have to do. And I'm gonna show you guys in the seminars how exactly we do that. All right, so now we're going to just quickly jump back over to the iPad screen and we're gonna look at our idea of basis and dimension. So this is gonna be the next little topic we're gonna to cover, it's very quick. But this is what I want to show you guys. In solid mechanics, nothing makes sense without defining a coordinate system. So this is what I kind of want to talk about, the idea of a coordinate system. If I were to set my coordinate system in this frame as that bottom left corner, so I have it something like this, well, that will give me a very specific set of X naught and Y naught. And then after that, it'll give me a very specific set of numbers for X one and Y one. Makes sense? If I were to move this coordinate system, let's say down over here, over to this side over here, well then of course all of our components of X naught, Y naught, X1, Y naught, or X, Y1, <laughs> they're all going to change. So when it comes to the idea of solid mechanics, not so much in fluid mechanics, but more solid mechanics, we have to have a good coordinate system defined, which is going to lead us into our next topic. Now, before we actually jump into that, I just want to show you guys some attention to this coordinate system. If we were to look at the coordinate system, it's actually basically two vectors. We have what we would call a vector E1, and we would have vector E2. This is the same as if you guys were to say this is X and Y. Typically what we do is we would call E1 and E2, and these are referred to as basis vectors. These basis vectors define our coordinate system. So we're gonna jump back to the PowerPoint and we're gonna talk about basis and dimension. So if I have R2, we've already kind of hinted that this means that we have a two dimensional vector space. So in a two dimensional vector space, we need two basis vectors to make up this coordinate system. The one that most of you guys know is the vector one zero, so a horizontal line and the vector zero one, so a vertical line. If I were to draw this, it's going to look something like this. So of course you guys are saying, yeah, Clayton, I've seen this before many times. Well, this is what I mean by basis vectors. These are the vectors that are going to make up our coordinate system. Why is this so uh, important or so specific? Well, inside of this vector space, we're going to have a lot of vectors. Now what's important is that we can write every vector in our vector space as a function or as a linear combination of these basis vectors. So let's say I had vector v, which is three and two. Well, what I can do is I can kind of expand that into three multiplied by the vector one zero plus two multiplied by the vector zero one. So notice how I took this vector in my vector space and I multiplied it or I expressed it as a linear combination of our basis vectors e1 and e2. So that's the key here with these basis vectors. We have to be able to use them to express every vector in our space as a linear combination of them. We can do the exact same thing for three dimensions. So the most common basis vectors that you guys may guess is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. Pictorially, this is going to look something like this, or the, which is reminiscent of a Cartesian vector system, nice and easy. And just like before, in three dimensions, we have to be able to use these three basis vectors to express every vector in this space as a linear combination of those basis vectors. So if I were to look at V, which is four, negative two, and one, well, I can actually express this as a linear combination of those basis vectors. Now, in order to do this and to be able to express things as linear combinations, we actually have to have something called linear independence. All right, linear independence. So when we have a set of vectors, they are either gonna be one or two things. It's going to be either linearly dependent or it's going to be linearly independent. So this is going to be a question you guys will see on your midterms. This will be a question you guys will see in the assignment where I basically give you a set of vectors and I say, is this linearly dependent or independent? Now, again, the key here and why we're teaching this is that for us to create an actual basis set, we need our set to be linearly independent. So a set of vectors is linearly independent if none of the vectors in the set can be expressed as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. 
So if we were to look at this set right here, u, and we were to have a second vector v or w down here, we can see that I cannot actually express w as a linear combination of u. So these two vectors would be linearly independent. They can form a basis set if I wanted to. But if I were to have a third vector v, which has the same direction as u, well, we can see that I can actually express v as a linear combination of u. If I were to take the scalar 2 and multiply it by v, well, then I get my vector u. So though if, therefore, those two vectors would actually be linearly dependent. Now, sometimes it's not always obvious if it's going to be linearly dependent or independent. But what's nice for us is we have a method that will allow us to kind of solve for if it will be or will not be. So to determine if something is linearly dependent or independent of two vectors, u and v, all we have to do is solve the following equation, where we have a scalar alpha 1 multiplied by the first vector plus the scalar 2, so alpha 2, multiplied by the second vector is equal to the zero vector. So we're basically going to create a system of equations. Now from here we're going to have two possible outcomes. The first one is alpha 1 and alpha 2 both equal zero. So all of the scalars in this formula are equal to zero. This means that the vectors are linearly independent. The second scenario is that if one of alpha 1 or alpha 2, so as long as one of them does not equal zero, the vectors are linearly dependent. All right, so all we're going to do is solve the system of equations to determine if it's independent or dependent. So all we can do is we can actually carry this to our example above. And if I were to compare the vectors u and v, which we already said is linearly dependent because we were able to see from the picture, I can go alpha 1 times u plus alpha 2 times v is equal to 0. So then I get my system of equations where I got alpha 1 times 4, 4 to comma 2 plus alpha 2 times 2 comma 1 is equal to 0. Well, I can actually figure out that I can find alpha 1 is 1 and alpha 2 is negative 2 and this actually gives me the zero vector. So since some of these scalar or yeah, some of these scalars are not equal to zero, we can say that u and v are linearly dependent. But if we were to go to the other two vectors, u and w, and solve this equation, the only way this equation holds is that if alpha one is equal to zero and alpha two is equal to zero. And because of this, since all of those scalars are equal to zero, u and w are actually linearly independent. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, I don't know, this looked a little bit wonky. Can we do more examples? Well, yes, of course. So I'm gonna move back over to the iPad here and we're gonna go over a couple examples of if these vectors are linearly dependent or independent. So we're gonna start off with A here. And question one is very simple. It just says, are the following sets linearly dependent, which we will say is L, D, or are they linearly independent, which I'm going to put as L, I. All right, so when you guys see one of these questions, we typically say that we have a set of vectors B. So again, it's the set of vectors X and Y, and we give you what the two vectors are. So we say that X is one comma zero, and we say that Y is five comma zero. So what we're going to do is we're gonna go back to that system of equations that we discussed before, and we can see, or we're gonna try and see what those coefficients are going to be. So again, the, the system I wanna try and solve for would be this. We're gonna have a coefficient alpha one times my vector x plus a coefficient alpha two times a vector y. And we want to make this equal to the zero vector. And we're gonna try and solve for what alpha one and alpha two are going to be. So I could come down a little bit and I can write this as, okay, well, we got alpha one multiplied by the vector x. We know that x is equal to one, zero, just like that. And I say, all right, well, then we got alpha two multiplied by vector y. We look at vector y, well, it's five comma zero. And this, of course, has to be equal to the zero vector. So since our vectors have two components, our zero vector is going to have two components. Now, if we were to look at this, we can say, all right, we actually have two equations here. We have alpha one times one plus alpha two times five is equal to zero. And then we have alpha one times zero plus alpha two times zero is equal to zero. So then what I like to do 
of course, is just going to be writing out my equations. So I'm going to have alpha 1 multiplied by 1 plus alpha 2 multiplied by 5 is equal to 0. So there's equation number 1. I took alpha 1 and I multiplied it by 1. I took alpha 2, multiplied it by 5. There's equation 1. So I just want to make sure that you guys know exactly where I'm getting these things so hopefully it doesn't <laughs> scare you guys away. All right, so now we're going to create our equation 2. So instead of multiplying by the first component of the vectors, we're going to multiply by the second component. We're going to have alpha 1 times 0 plus alpha 2 times 0 is equal to 0. So as we can see, equation 2 really doesn't tell us anything because we have 0 plus 0 is equal to 0. So in this particular case, I would actually kind of just cross it off because it doesn't really tell us anything. Well, I, I don't really cross it off, I just, I squiggle. I get rid of it completely. So if we were to look at equation number one here, we have alpha one, actually let's just write it so that we really know what it is. So if we were to simplify this, we have alpha one plus five times alpha two is equal to zero. Now if we were to look at this equation, we have one equation with two unknowns, which means that there are infinite possibilities. If there is infinite possibilities, there are cases where alpha one, so alpha one or alpha two do not equal zero. And since one of them does not equal zero, we would actually say that this right here is going to be linearly dependent. The only way it's linearly independent if, if both alpha one and alpha two equal zero. Again, we look at our equation, we have infinite possibilities, Therefore, there's going to be a possibility where one of those coefficients do not equal zero. So that's going to be the first one, linearly dependent. If we move on to the second one, we're going to do the exact same process. So again, the first thing I like to do is just write out my equation. So we have alpha one, our coefficient, times our first vector. In this case, it's x, which is one zero. So I'm going to go one comma zero. And we're going to add it to alpha two and multiplied by y, and y is 0, comma 5. And this, of course, has to be equal to our 0 vector. Now again, you guys can skip this step because it starts becoming very obvious, but if you guys want, you guys can start writing out the different equations. So in this case, we have alpha 1 times 1 plus alpha 2 times 0 is equal to 0. So that's equation 1. And then we have alpha one times zero plus alpha two times five is equal to zero. <clears throat> so again, what I like to do is I like to try and simplify the equations as much as possible. In the first equation, I have alpha two multiplied by zero. Well, that's a whole lot of nothing, so I can scribble it out. And in the second equation, I have alpha one times zero. So again, a whole lot of nothing. I can scribble it out, and then I can simplify the equations. So equation one says that alpha one is equal to zero. Well, that's simple, it solved itself. And then the second equation says five alpha two is equal to zero. Well, we know that the only way equation two is able to hold is if alpha two is equal to zero. So I can just erase the five, alpha two is equal to zero. So in this, uh, particular case, both alpha one and alpha two are both equal to zero. Therefore, we would actually say that this right here, actually, I think I did it in pink. Let's go back to pink. We would say that this right here is linearly independent. And what this means is that these two vectors, one zero and zero comma five, they can actually form a basis set or a coordinate system. Again, that's why we're doing all this. So that's those two. If we move on, we can explore cases where there are three vectors. Now, before we get into this one, this is actually a very special case. And that's why I didn't leave a lot of room here. Just by looking at this, I know that this is going to be linearly dependent. All right, linearly dependent. And here's the trick. This is a great one for exams. I don't usually put this on the first midterm because I just told you the trick. You guys will still remember it, but come in December, <laughs> you guys will forget all of this and this is when the trick really uh, really gets to screw you guys. The trick is this. 
we see that one of the vectors in this set, which I'm going to highlight here, is the zero vector. If we ever have a zero vector in any sort of case, we know that this is going to be linearly dependent. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to show this, but the most simple way I find students like the most is let's just write one of the equations. I'm not going to write the entire system, but let's just go for the first equation. We're going to have alpha 1 times 1 plus alpha 2 times 0. So this comes from the vector y. And we move on to vector uh, z. So we're going to have plus alpha 3 times, uh, in this case, it's 0. And this is going to be equal to 0. I might as well just write them both. So in the second one, we have alpha 1 times 0 plus alpha 2 times 5 plus alpha 3 times again 0. So if we were to look at these two over here, I'm just going to highlight them, the alpha 3s, because it's always with the 0 vector, it never matters what alpha 3 is going to be. Alpha 3 can be anything because it's always multiplied by the zero vector, so it's going to give us zero. And because of that, we can conclude right away that these are going to be linearly dependent. Alpha three can always be anything we want, really. So let's move on to an example where we don't have the zero vector. So we're gonna go on to part D right here, and this is where things get, again, a little bit crazy, because now we have three vectors. Or, yeah, we have three vectors, but they have two components. But the methodology stays the same. We're always solving the same equation for coefficients. So we're going to say, all right, well, we got alpha 1 multiplied by 1 plus alpha 2 multiplied by 0. So this comes from the vector y. And then plus alpha 3 times 4. This comes from vector z. And we know that this is equal to 0. Our second equation, we have alpha 1 multiplied by 0. So this comes from x plus alpha 2 multiplied by 5 plus alpha 3 multiplied by 3. And this is going to be equal to 0. So the best way to solve these again is to try and simplify as much as possible. First equation, we have alpha 2 times 0. So this is going to kind of go away. And in the second equation, we have alpha 1 times 0. So this is also going to go away. So now if we look at this, we have two equations, three unknowns. Now we know from linear algebra that this is also going to have infinite solutions. So since there's going to be infinite solutions, we know that this is going to be linearly dependent. All right, linearly dependent. I hope that you guys can see that. And if you guys were to go through this equation right here for part E, and we were to try and simplify it as much as possible. So we can see that alpha 1 times 0 down here, alpha 1 times 0 down here, alpha 2 times 0, alpha 2 times 0, and then alpha 3 times 0. We have the exact same thing, where now we have two equations, but we have three unknowns. Infinite solutions, therefore we know that this is going to be linearly dependent. We can move on to the last one right here, and I'm going to switch back to green where we have our three equations, three unknowns. But once we start canceling things, so we're going to have alpha 2 multiplied by 0, alpha 1 by 0, alpha 1 by 0, alpha 2 times 0, alpha 3, and then this one. So now if we look here, we have three equations, three unknowns. But if we were to start solving some things, for instance, if we were to go down to the bottom one, we have alpha 3 times 3 is equal to 0. Well, the only way that'll ever hold is if alpha 3 is equal to 0. Looking at the second equation, we have 5 times alpha 2 is equal to 0. The only way that'll ever hold is, of course, alpha 2 is equal to 0. Now, the first equation, we have alpha 3 times 4 plus alpha 1. But we know that alpha 3 right here, we already know that that's equal to 0. We solved for it. So this is actually gone. So we have alpha 1 is equal to 0. So from here we go alpha 1. That's going to be equal to 0. And since alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 are all equal to 0, we know that this set right here is going to be linearly independent.
All right, so hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Last example we're going to cover is this one. And it's one of those tricky ones where it looks really bad because there's a lot of words, but it's actually very simple. The question says the set B, which is E1 and E2. So again, this is referring to the basis set E1 and E2, where E1 is 1 comma 1 and E2 is 0 comma 1 is linearly independent and therefore can form a basis set for R2. So this really doesn't contribute too much to the question. It just says that we have a set of vectors E1 and E2 and they form a basis set in R2 because they are linearly independent. It says in this case, the vector u, which is three comma four, can be uniquely expressed in terms of these basis vectors. Again, that's why we have these basis vectors so that we can write every vector in our space as a linear combination of them. So what this linear combination would look like is this right here, where our vector u can be some coefficient u1 multiplied by the first basis vector plus some other coefficient u2 multiplied by the second basis vector. Now this particular question, all it wants us to do is figure out these coefficients u1 and u2. It's actually nice and simple. So if we were to look at our equation, I'm just writing this right from above, we know that u is equal to u1, which is a coefficient mul multiplied by the basis vector e1. And then this is added to a second coefficient u2 multiplied by the basis vector e2. Nice and simple so far. And all we want to do is solve for u1 and u2. So what I like to do in these type of questions is just to start substituting everything I know. So we know that u, it says right here, is three comma four. So I'm gonna say, all right, well, we have the vector three comma four, and this is equal to a coefficient u1, which again, we're trying to solve for, so we don't know what that is multiplied by basis vector E1. I come up here, we get, we are, we are provided with E1. We know it's one comma one. So I'm gonna come back down here. So U1 is multiplied by one comma one. And then this is added to a second coefficient U2 multiplied by the second basis vector. So I'm gonna come up and we are going to see E2, which is zero comma one. I'm gonna come down. I'm gonna say, all right, this is zero and this is one. So all we have to do is solve for these two unknowns. Now, the first thing that gets students is they look at this and they think that they have one equation, but two unknowns. But remember, if we have uh, vectors, <clears throat> the number of components is the number of equations we actually have. So what I can do is I can write this as two equations. The first one is three is equal to u1 multiplied by one plus u2 multiplied by zero. And then the second equation would be four is equal to u1 times one plus u2 multiplied by one. Now this is nice because we can look at this and we can actually start solving for what u1 and u2 are. It's actually that simple. We look at equation one, we have u2 multiplied by zero. Well, that goes away. Therefore, we're left with three is equal to u1 times one. Well, it's fairly simple to see that u1 is simply just gonna be equal to three. We can then use this in the second equation, because if we look at the second equation, we have u1 times one. Well, we know that this is actually just three times one plus u2 times one. So this is just going to be u2. And this of course is all equal to four. So we basically have four is equal to three plus u2. Well, we can easily figure out that u2 is equal to one. So that's this question. Again, it's actually extremely simple. It's just a lot of word garbage that really confuses students. The trick you guys wanna look for to see if the question is asking you to do this is that if it ever says one of two things. The first is linear combination or the second one, which is actually used in this one, is uniquely expressed or uniquely expanded. If you ever hear that, what we're basically doing is we're taking our vector and then we're going to express it in terms of the basis vectors. So that's it for this uh, set of questions. Now, one thing that I forgot to do at the end of lecture, not forgot to do, I, I don't want to say that because it makes me sound dumb. 
One thing that I was unable to do because of internet constraints in the first lecture was quiz one, which are these mathematical symbols. So we're just going to wrap this up really quick and this will be the end of today's lecture. So this is what we covered in the first lecture. And again, it was just trying to discuss what the different types of mathematical symbols are. So we're gonna go down these list of questions and we are just going to go true or false. So we're given three sets of numbers. We have A, we have B, and we have C. And all we're going to do is answer these true or false questions. So the first question is B is an element of A. A lot of people would put true because they look at B and they say, well, B has two, four, and 20. And if I were to look at A, it has two, four, and 20. Well, they have all the same components, then sure, B is an element of A. But A, or not, not A, the set, but part A here, uh, this is actually false. And this will get a lot of students. This is usually the first tricky one. And the reason why is this, B is a set, not an element. So since it's a set, it can't be an element of A, since it is a set. If we were to look at part B here, where we say that B is a subset of A, then that is true. So this one right here, this is true. And the reason why this is true is because again, B has all the elements that A has, but we can't say that B is an element itself. So the first one's true, the second, or sorry, the first one is false because B cannot be an element. And then the second one is true because B would indeed be a subset. So hopefully that makes sense. I know that's the one that usually gets a lot of students is just that part A right there. Moving on, we have part C. And part C is a little bit weird. It says for every element in A, that element is also in B. So what this basically means is that every element in A has to also be in B. If we were to look at this, we know just intuitively that this is going to be, of course, false. And the reason why is because if we look at A, it has six elements. B only has three, so there's no possible way all six can be in B. So this right here, we would say that this is false. But if we were to swap it the other way around in part D where it says for every element in B, that element is also in A, well then we can look at it and say, all right, well B has two, four, and six, and A has two, four, and not six, and not 20. And if we look here, we can say, yes, every element that is in B is also in A. So this right here would be true. Hopefully this is making sense to you guys. It should be a nice little easy thing to, to hopefully understand. Now it starts getting a little bit weird when we get to part E and it says that there exists an element in A that is also in C. So the key here is for the first part, uh, C and D, where we have that upside down A, that is for every. So every element has to be applicable. When we get to this backwards E, we don't have to have every element. We just have to have at least one. So if we were to look here, what this question is asking is, there is an element in A, just one or more, that is also in C. If we were to look at A, and I'm just gonna erase these check marks so we can go together. Da -da. If we look at A, there is an element in A, which is one, that is also in C. So this would be true. Part E would be true. There is an element in A that is also in C. Now, if we go to part F here, it says there exists a unique element in A that is also in C. And if we look here, this would also be true. So the difference between D, or sorry, E and F is that E is sum of the elements, but F is only one element. If we were to compare A and C, there is indeed only one single element that is shared between them, which is the one. So this would be true. Now, to show you guys what I mean further, is let's say that A also contained the number 40. Well, in that case, then A has two elements that C has. So this right here, F, would then be false because there is now more than one element. F right here, when we have this explanation sign, this means that there can only be one. And since the only one was there, that's why it'd be true. 
All right, so now we have the last one that says for every element in C, or sorry, not for every, there exists an element in C that is also in B. So if we were to come up here, we're basically saying that one of these two elements in C also has to be in B. Well, one is not in B and 40 is not in B. So therefore this right here would be false because there is no element in C that is also in B. So that's this quiz. Should be nice and easy. Hopefully it's not, uh, not too bad for you guys. Most of it is self-explanatory, but uh, I just want to make sure. And that concludes today's lecture. So I hope that uh, you guys enjoyed it. Again, I, I apologize for the technical difficulties at the university. Hopefully by the next lecture, it'll be good to go. And then I won't have to <laughs> re-record re everything. That kind of sucks. So yeah, uh, that's it for today's lecture. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching. I will see you guys in lecture three.